I am pleased to be here in the province of the Western Cape to contribute to a strategic planning meeting which must outline the objective of the EFF in this province for a year. We all know that it has been 10 years and the EFF in Western Cape in that 10 years has not won even a single watt. And the EFF is still to reach a breach of 5% in the Western Cape. So we are here today as an organization to speak about how do we achieve the most basic so that we too can be counted amongst the provinces that makes a positive and huge contribution to the strength and the growth of the organization, both internally and also as a result of the electoral support. In this province, we know that's where Jan van Riebeck arrived. And as an organization that is formed on the principle of anti-colonialism and anti-imperialism, an organization that is formed on anti-racism, an organization that prides itself on blackness and continues to want to conscientize our people on black consciousness, as an organization that is born out of Marikana massacre, we are supposed to be one of the most powerful organizations in this province. Because here, white monopoly capital itself is born out of genocide, which was committed by the colonialists when they arrived here and enslaved our people. Our struggle for land and indignity begins with the wars of dispossession that happened and started in this province, in which the Koi and the Sen were the first in line in defense against the enemy from Europe which wanted to conquer our land and the wealth of our country. It therefore, the logic of the EFF should gain the most expression here because when you talk about the land disposition and the expropriation of land without compensation, it should resonate with the people of the Western Cape because their immediate history is that of coming directly into conflict with those who wanted to take our land under the pretext that they are just resting for tea, they will be passing. The people who still have uh, toilets that are not clean and not flushing are found here in the Western Cape. Those people of the Porta Porta toilets that are not clean should actually be finding their home in the EFF and see the EFF as an alternative to their suffering. The people that live in the shacks, the people that are unemployed, the farm workers that are paid with alcohol in Franchuk, in Stellenbosch, in all those areas, should see the EFF as a shelter for the exploited farm workers. It should be easy to organize for the EFF in this province because that's where we find racism being displayed unashamedly by the white racists that have given this province to themselves and even now are advocating that this province should stand on its own, independent from South Africa. 
our young people in this province, the homeless in this province, our colored communities in this province, our African communities in this province have been consumed by alcohol abuse and drugs and they are in a permanent state of torture perpetuated against them by gangsterism, which is not confronted both by the state and by anyone who says, I am ready to lead in the Western Cape. So we still have a lot of work, and it is this plenum which must find solution to some of these problems I'm talking about. We must be the first organization that comes out of this plenum with a clear agenda on how we are going to defeat femicide and GBV. How are we going to defeat gangsterism? How are we going to reclaim the streets of Western Cape? How are we going to remove the drugs through exposing the drug lords in our communities? How are we going to make sure that the young people of this province, irrespective of the color of their skin, benefit from the opportunities that are presented in this government of the Western Cape as it relates to employment and business? How are we going to confront white supremacy that continues to perpetuate to be perpetuated here in the Western Cape by those who are unashamedly saying the Western Cape belongs to white people because they discovered it and there was no one when they arrived here. How do we begin to teach the people of Western Cape black consciousness? That being black is not necessarily the color of your skin, but the state of your mind. Because you can have the same color of skin with Ramaphosa, but with completely different state of mind. Because Ramaphosa is not black, and to confuse him to be black will be emanating out of the ignorance of what characterizes black consciousness ideology. Because not everybody in a black skin is necessarily black. You might be in a black skin, but be non-white. And that's what Ramaphosa is. He's not black, he's non-white. All his thinking, all his ways of doing things are towards the agenda of white supremacist. And therefore, being black is not inherently progressive unless you have sharpened your understanding with black consciousness. Hence, in the EFF, we pride ourselves of being the students of Fanon so that we have an appreciation of what does it mean to be black? Because if you say everything else black is inherently progressive and it is for the black people, then the government of the day will mean in that defini narrow definition of progressiveness will mean that the government of the day is progressive. But we all know that this government is managing the affairs on behalf of the ruling class. And who is the ruling class? The ruling class is white monopoly capital that owns the means of production. And these are the clerks who surrendered during the negotiations out of the country when capital left the country to meet the ANC in exile. They were given very clear instructions that you are going to come back into the country 
We are going to release you from prison and we are going to give you your voting powers. After that is business as usual. Meaning you don't tamper with the patterns of property ownership, with the business ownership, with the land ownership, with the minerals ownership. And because someone was disparate to become president at all costs and quickly agreed to everything else without having an appreciation that this will have a serious bearing on our children 30 years down the line. Everybody became obsessed with being a minister. Everybody became obsessed with being driven with blue lights. Everybody became obsessed with managing the budget of the state and did not bother to enter into the details of what is business as usual. We are the only country where we say the revolution took place but the oppressor lost nothing. How can they be revolution and the oppressor loses nothing and the oppressed gains nothing? So, there's never been a revolution in South Africa. There's been an arrangement that you shall come back, rule, but it's business as usual. To show that Indeed, they complied to business as usual. In 1994, the white capital started hiring black people into their companies in senior positions and gave some of these black people shares in their companies and said, no, it can't be business as usual. There is a new government. Obvious, we have to change. Without policies of the BEE. But these whites then realize, ah, this government is not concerned about that. It's not concerned about us bringing black people into our business, into our ownership of the means of production. Then they released them. And that's why it continued business as usual. We cannot allow a situation where it continues business as usual 10 years after the existence of the EFF. Because the first option we took was that the EFF is going to use the election as one of the means to capture political power and use its majority through political power to change the patterns of ownership in South Africa. So, you can't capture the state power if you don't have an organization. You must first have an organization in the Western Cape. You can't fight the racist of Stellenbosch without an organization. You can't occupy land without an organization. You cannot say the people of Google too and Kylie China everywhere else are going to live a better life without an organization. Because there is a difference between mobilization and organization. Mobilization is activity based. Organization is longevity. It's forever. So, calling people to the stadium and filling up the FNB must never be confused to be meaning. This is a reflection of the strength of our organization. It's a mobilization. You may be lucky that that day when you organize people to the stadium, there is no derby there. So, people are so bored so much that the only activity that is happening is that of the EFF, and then they come to pass time, and you confuse that to mean an organizational strength. As we are going to the FNB now, a lot of our comrades are going to fetch people here 
in the Western Cape to the FNB Stadium. And when that stadium becomes packed, you might think this is the strength of the EFF, only to find that the people of Kailicha wanted to see Johannes back. <laughs> and then you confuse that to mean the EFF is very strong. Can't the people were going on a trip. When they come back, it's business as usual. They don't care about what happened. So the organization is when you recruit them, convert that quantity into quality and have them appreciate the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF, its founding manifesto, its constitution, its code of conduct and way of doing things. Then these people, when they are called to a meeting of the EFF, they do not give an excuse. They are always looking forward to go to a meeting of the EFF. When they tweet, when they write on Facebook, when they write on WhatsApp, they do not write things that will negatively affect the organization. They always write to promote and to defend the organization. If you've got such cadres, now you've got the organization. Yesterday, in the a plenum, national plenum, we called the, uh, the research company, uh, SG, Ipsos, which said the EFF is now more popular than Malema. Then that tells you we now are heading towards having an organization. Because the organization cannot rely, its success cannot rely on the survival of an individual. That's what happened to the PAC. They knew that the survival of the PAC depend on Robert Subukwe. That's why they arrested Subukwe without laws and introduced Subukwe laws to frustrate the growth of the PAC, and they succeeded in doing that. We saw that and said, ours must be a protest movement, ours must be an organization that we are going to build the ground up, and it must be rooted amongst our people, and it should not derive pleasure out of hanging around with the elite. But derive pleasure out of helping individuals, not groups, individuals who seek help in communities. Because at times, we go into communities and then regravel the road and put a tar road and put the street lights without attending to individual problems of this old woman who needs a wheelchair, and then sing from the big podiums that we have given the people of Kailicha everything they want. Well and good, you gave them everything they want, but you do not know the individual concerns. Because a counselor of the EFF must know the community where she or he comes from, by their names. When you walk into my ward and bump into me as a counselor and say I'm looking for Malema family, I should be able to tell you without thinking twice that there's nothing Malema here. There's no Malema family. You are lost. Describe them. Then you describe them and you say all men of this and no, 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 no. I can tell you now there's no Malema family. Because a counselor it's not a minister. It's not an MEC. It's a community activist. You cannot be a counselor if you are not in love with the people. You can't love the people after. You can't love the people after being elected a counselor. You ought to bond. You ought to love the people. You have to help them with their individual problems before you can ask them to elect you as a counselor. 
So the EFF has got a campaign called Andris Tatan. Andris Tatan is one of the comrades who was killed in Free State who was protesting for service delivery, water, and all manner of things. So we've got a campaign called Andris Tatan Cleanup Campaign. On my way here from Cape Town, I saw a lot of rubble and dumping areas on the left. No EFF branch or region. Where is the Western Cape Chairperson? I mean, uh, uh, Metro. The Metro Chairperson. You, you can't, from Cape Town, coming this direction into our areas where our people are, pass a dumping area, illegal dumping area, and pass it and not feel anything, and say you are in love with our people. It cannot be correct, because all of you here, if you were to enter your yard today and find a sword sack outside the bin next to the gate, you will always want to know what's happening now. Is today the municipality coming to collect uh, or not? If not, we have to make sure this thing lives because it can't be here. Because you love your family, you love your children, you can't expose them to such an environment. But you're passing every day that illegal dumping, that rubble there, every day. You, you, nothing moves in you. Nothing happens in you. And the best excuse you were to give if I was to ask him, uh, why are you not cleaning that place? He's going to say, we are not in government. We are not a municipality. Meaning, you are going to love your people the day you become a municipality. Before you become municipality, you will never love your people. Love them before. Show them your love before. They will respond with roses when they vote in 2024. We don't have to be in power. There is no EFF member or leader who must be found idling and doing nothing and saying, I'm bored. Bored of what? When there are so many challenges in these communities. Let's go into Langa now and see what's, what's going to happen. Immediately on arrival, there are so many things that say to us, you can have a program that includes the people and work with the people to make that place a better place. It's not just Andris Tatane, a clean-up campaign. It's a campaign that we clean after ourselves. Why do we clean after ourselves? It's because we love ourselves. And once we start demonstrating that we love ourselves, it's the first step to demolish the colonialist and white mentality that black people do not love themselves. They don't have to, no one has to tell them black people stay here. As they pass, by how dirty the place is, they already know it's black people who stay here. Why do you know it's so dirty? Why is it so dirty? They don't love themselves. You don't have to be rich. You don't have to wear expensive. Just be clean for people to respect you. Because by being clean, you already demonstrate to these people and you are telling them without opening your mouth how they must address you. But if you are going to look like a hobo, and then you appear here at the door and say you are a, a chairperson of Metro who looks like a hobo. But there are two people who came here taking chances like you. That's right. <laughs> but when you are clean and you say, I'm a chairperson of the Metro, even when you are not a chairperson of the Metro, they open the door. So no. Thank you, sir. We've been waiting for you. Just be clean, and you can't be clean in appearance as an individual coming out of a dirty place. We don't have money. 
We can't build houses for ourselves. Fine. But our shacks can exist in a clean environment where it becomes a community, a collective community responsibility that we may be poor, but we love ourselves. That should be a mentality of a black man because they have made you to think that you are less of a human being. And once you liberate your mind, the white man will never love that about you. You are actually going to appear cheeky. You know, one thing I like about Nigerians is not about these things that you accuse them about. A Nigerian man, if he comes in here and speak, you won't doubt that this man has got confidence. So white people refer to them as being rude. That's why in Nigeria you don't find a lot of white people. Because when you speak to them and they don't hear properly, yes, sir. ah, what do you mean by that? What do you mean? And then you think he's fighting like, no, he wants to understand what he's not fighting. But you, they taught you that if you don't hear, sorry, sir, can you repeat that? So they enjoy that. They enjoy this submissive attitude of a black man because to them you are boys and girls. They don't enjoy a person who speaks standing firm looking right into their eyes and unshaken. That's what we should be. That's what we should be. We must be, and that thing comes out of liberating the mind. But if the mind becomes permanent weapon at the disposal of the oppressor, you will never do anything. You will continue to think less of yourself. You ought to liberate yourself. You cannot be EFF and still be sheepish. Once you join the EFF, it's a first step of mental liberation that I am not my ancestor. I am a generation now which will never take what my ancestors took from you. I will never tolerate that. So, they don't hate Malema. They are all shocked by this black man who can speak to them like that, who can speak like that, who can confront them like that, because all blacks must be submissive. And when they paralyze you, they even come and then patronize you. That know you are better than them. Those of you who even speak in that accent of theirs, yo, you even speak better than them. But well, I always get shocked that you say you don't want these colonial people, you want to be African, but you speak like Sir Ramapos. You can't speak like a person that you hate. You can't. You can't say, I hate these white people. They've oppressed us. They took everything from us. And then from there, you want to speak like them. Only in South Africa do we do that. You can go anywhere in the continent, including Zimbabwe, where they are educated better than us. They've got no accent. They've got Zimbabwean accent. They don't have this thing of yours. Because... They've never seen themselves in the image of a white man. They saw themselves in the image of an African man and accepted education as a form of liberation, not as a way of mimicking the colonialist and the imperialist. Because some of you confuse being educated to be meaning, I must talk like these white people. Otherwise, I am not educated. So, when we speak about a liberated man, 
It's a man who knows who she is and who he is. But once you've got a doubt about yourself, you will never liberate anyone. Because you are not liberated yourself. Now the EFF has recruited 1 million plus members. We have declared this year the year for massive political education and voter registration. All of those people were recruited into the EFF because we don't want them to become criminals. We must politicize them. Because a politician without political education is a potential criminal. So we need to educate our members so that they can articulate the policy position of the EFF very well. But most importantly, since we have formed the EFF 2014, we got 6%. That 6%, we didn't get it from the people we registered. We found them in the voters' roll. And then they gave us 6%. 2019, we got 10% of people we never registered. Now, let me tell you what happened in Tefliop, University of Limpopo, first year when the student command was contesting elections. They won elections, the first elections they won. But that election they won, SASCO did not lose a single vote. Actually, SASCO increased its votes, but still lost to the EFF. You know why? The EFF brought in new voters completely and never relied on taking SASCO's voters. And that is what we must do now. We must go and bring new voters into the voters' role so that in 2024, when that person votes, says, I am voting, I am in this voters' role because I was brought by the EFF. You have been benefiting wrongly from other people's voters who are disgruntled. So many voters who are registered are not voting. We need to find them and we need to bring them to come and vote. So many voters who qualify to register and vote, they are not registered, they are not voting. We need to find them. We need, if we say we need 5 million votes, if we say we need 10 million votes, we are going to have to register 10 million people of our own from here in Western Cape, allocate each and every branch, its target like we did with the membership to Musina, and say once we bring them together, we know we've got 10 million voters fresh registered by the EFF. And even when you say to them, come, let's go and vote. They will come because they know this is the party that made me understand and accept to register to vote. Yesterday, I was listening to Meg G's podcast. Uncle Vinny, they asked him there, are you voting? He says, no, I'm voting. They say, which party are you voting for? He says, EFF. Why? Because as a young man, when he opened his eyes, the only party that was relevant to him was the EFF. So we need to go and get these young voters, all of them, who when they open their eyes, the first political party they know is the EFF. The same way your grandmother says to you, you are asking me to commit a sin. Are you asking me to vote against the party of Nelson Mandela. We need to bring a generation up that is going to grow with the EFF and will never turn against the EFF. <laughs> when we formed the EFF, my own grandmother asked me, hey, Chief, are you saying now we must move from Mandela's party? I said, yes. It was not an easy decision. And that's why that day when she went to vote, I was like, I'm going with you. <laughs> because I must make sure you do a right thing. The way you love this Mandela. Remember, 
uh, Mandela was the, uh, what do you call it? Not idol. Crush. Uh, Mandela was their crush. So they are told, hey, that crush is no longer a crush. Like, ah, these kids don't understand how far we come with this guy. Understandably so. That's what they grew up knowing. We can use the same strategy by capturing them young and make sure they grow up with the only organization they know called the EFF. In that way, they are likely to even influence their children and the ch their children of their children. So, when we say we are registering voters, don't think that we are in a business of ruling next year. Uh -uh. Ours is a revolutionary cause. Because by the time we take it, these ideas, these radical ideas must be grounded and people should be knowing and understanding what are these ideas, how am I going to benefit from these ideas. Because we don't want to be a rebound. Because people have divorced with the ANC and they are still hurt and bitter. They just look around and they think they are in love. They come and say, yeah, EFF. When the reality hits home, they're like, yes, yes, man. That time I was miserable. This is not what I was looking for. We have to make them understand the politics of the EFF. You know, I was saying we need to, and I, you know, comrades, many of you commit mistakes. You think because, I, I, and when I talk, I'm not literally reading here. Uh, therefore, I'm talking my own things. I'm not. When I say to you, you ought to have metric or equivalent for you to lead. It's not me. It's in the code of conduct of public representatives. But because you don't read and you claim to be a leader, you are only mukhabulo. You get it from Twitter and social media, you never read EFF documents. Then you say, oh, this guy is coming with a new police. You joined something you don't know. That's why you get shocked every time we give a speech. Everything I said here is in the policies of the EFF. I'm not thinking on top of my head. This speech I'm reading is not the speech written by me, I'm given by the EFF, we want you to deliver this message. But because I know these things, I just look at what is the next item, then I speak about it. Why should people have metric? Why should people have qualifications? It's because we want to deploy the best of the best into government. Because we cannot replace mediocrity with another mediocrity. This country, it is where it is because of mediocre deployment of the ANC. Why should we even ever debate and defend each other about a metric? You can't say you thrive through superior logic if that superior logic has never been tested as an organized thought. Mbalula speaks about the EFF is an anarchist, demagogy, and all of that, yet they say they thrive on superior logic. And then he doesn't say, Mbalula doesn't say EFF, by the way. Every time he speaks, he speaks, he says Malema. And he becomes personal like that. He calls my grandmother's surname at every turn, and when I respond, I'm going to be accused of being personal. But I'm being attacked here. My grandmother's surname is being used to attack a cause. Then he says, these people, uh, they say they thrive on superior logic. This is not superior logic. But how can Mbalula know superior logic? How come? Because Mbalula has never said for metric for his organized thought to be tested. Huh? He has never done course one and course two for his organized thought to be tested. 
Because you can, it can only be a superior logic if your thought process has been subjected to peer review and you know that your peers appreciate your thinking. At that, you don't defend the thesis. You defend the proposal. They say, what do you want to write about? You say, this is what I want to write about. They say, okay, come here. Come and present it in the master's class where your peers are and they engage you. I've done that. Mbalula has not done that. And therefore, he doesn't qualify to speak about a superior logic because his organized thought has never been tested. I called him, I warned him, I said, don't, 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 don't start with me. Don't start with me because if those people are pumping you and saying, you are our match, you'll, you'll cry very soon. Do not become personal. So all I'm saying is that we don't want Mbalulas in the EFF. We want you to learn and become the best of the best. You know where to find them. You can't be lost. So, we cannot debate why we must go to school because as we speak today, the sewer systems are blocked. They are presided over by people who don't have metric. When technical the technicians and engineers present to them, they hear nothing. They can't understand the language. All he's waiting for is how much is in for me in this thing you are presenting. That is the only language they hear. How are you going to become the MMC of finance to deal with budget in those municipalities because we are now governing? We are governing in Joburg. We are going to govern now in Ikuruleni, in the Morali city, in some of the municipalities in KZN. How are you going to understand those things? You know what happens when we enter Johannesburg, we appointed now the MMC of health. She goes to work on Monday. She meets everybody and all of that. When she's about to leave, the acting HOD says, no, MMC, you have to sign here. Yeah, it's a procedure before they go to the council. Then she says, no, 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 no. Don't take those chances with me. You must give me these things to read. Why? Because she's educated. She will never run away from reading. But those who are not uh, familiar with reading, they will appreciate being given to sign. Because they, they don't have that process of reading. And we said, well, all those, about, I mean, less than 50 must have metric by December, by the end of the year. And metric, we don't mean metric per se. If you have never been into metric, your age qualifies you to go and do something equivalent at the Tibet College and do this and this and that and this. When they say, yes, metric, you say, no, I didn't reach that level, but this is what I've done uh, in line with what the organization requires from me. It's as simple as that. Why should we fight about that? Where's the student command here? I, I heard they say the student command. Where? Raise your hand. So, I read an article by your president justifying that people must not have metric. A president that presides over an organization that should be encouraging people to get the qualification. Mom Kaula is too old. She doesn't have to. She's got metric that she got from life. So you can't say, hey, hey, what about this one? No, there are those old people that exist amongst us. It's understandable. You can't even give them a headache. But the president of the student command writes an article, not a speech, not an impromptu interview. 
he sits down and processes that thought and say, no, there's no need for me to drink. I'm like, what type of uh, student leadership is this one? Then he forces me to go and check his credentials. Does he have uh, the first uh, degree? But no, he's still busy. Okay, how old is he? But yeah, that age guy, ah, now I understand why he's saying the things he's saying. Because in the constitution of the student command two, we ought to introduce the age limit. That uh, no fathers and mothers, married people and husbands, shall lead the student command. Unless, unless they've got the post uh, grad and then masters and this is understandable. But a father leading EFF student command without a post grad, we are introducing another SASCO, which turned the campuses into permanent residences. Campuses are not permanent residences. Anyone who goes to a campus and never stays and never leaves must know that you are preventing another child to come in. And it cannot be the EFF that prevents other children to not to come in. We ought to make education fashionable and it starts with the leadership of the EFF and made worse by the leadership of the student command. They have to be our flying colors. Narba Khalabe. We don't have to be obsessed with these things. As we speak, the SG is graduating in March. You know? And you have to ask. Then we must ask, is the leadership of the student command graduating? They ought to graduate. We cannot harbor amongst ourselves and even in the student command people that are not exemplary to society. I'm not here to make friendship. I don't even care if you elect me tomorrow or not. All I'm here to do is to make my mark. I'm trying to get a farm so that the day you chase me away, I don't become a problem. I just leave and go to my farm and do farming and I don't trouble anyone. But I'm not going to sit here for so many years and when I'm asked what have you done and I say no nothing I must say I produced graduates which hated me when I was talking and thanked me when they were graduating yes. I want to produce the best for the South African society when they say where are the best of the best they must say in the EFF. Ipsos came, by the way, in plenum, and it says, we did a research on you five years ago. You were, your supporters were the most illiterate people. Today, your support is of people who've got postgraduate, they are qualified, they've got metric. <laughs> Not only that, you were constituted and supported by the unemployed. Today, you are supported by people who earn more than 5,500. Destroying the myth of that woman of DA, uh, the former chief whip, Mazzoni, who said the EFF is an organization of the illiterate. I think he was confusing us for John Steinhazen. Or that surgery she did on her lips affected her mind. Because all of a sudden she just rocks up in parliament with new lips that looks like Vienna. We're like, what's happening now? So we thought she was doing a surgery for the lips. The pain affected the brain. Then she's confusing us for staying as it. Says EFF. Ipsos says. The EFF is no longer an organization 
that is supported by the elite rate. The EFF is now supported by educated people and employed people. It doesn't mean the elite rate and the unemployed are not there. But our support amongst those who are working and those who are educated has increased by Ipsos. I'm quoting the source. I'm not quoting Marshall Dlamini Stele, uh, where he comes from, where, and my, with my guys are talking under the tree. Uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh, uh -uh. We, we are talking science, properly researched by a credible institution, because as a Marxist, you ought to believe in science. And from time to time, you ought to call those researchers to come and tell you what is the feeling out there? Whether you like it or not, it is what it is. So we are going to go to school. And no one is going to discourage us from not going to school. Not even president of the student command. I've asked the SG to write me a letter and ask him for his qualifications. When did you start? When are you finishing? If it has gone beyond, what is the problem? How can we help you? We need to help him if there is a problem. Because the reason why we didn't go to school when we were in the youth league and in the ANC is because no one asked us that question. We were drinking alcohol and, uh, with old people and doing all manner of things. No one has ever paused to say, but why are you not going to school? And we can't repeat that ourselves with our young ones. We ought to remind them, whether they like it or not, you ought to finish your course. You must ask this one here of a spokesperson. I told him, you are not going to do that. You are going to finish that course at uh, UCT. He finished, said, no, president, I'm done. I said, register another one at Vets University. I'm told he is troubling him. But... Uh, <laughs> He has to finish. He must finish and go to master's and finish and go to PhD. They are young. They've got no excuse. And what is worse, the money is there. He doesn't have to take the family money. He doesn't have to take anyone's money. Parliament is paying for them. They have no reason not to get the highest and the best qualification. Why are we pushing them in a manner we are doing? It is because they are smart. They are just playful. Someone has to put pressure on them. Then they will have an appreciation that I can do this. We believe in them. That's why we say they must go to school. The money is there. We need to produce the best. When they say the best doctor of the brain must be coming from the EFF. The heart surgeon must be coming from the EFF. All of these things that we think are complicated and difficult should come, to, should come from the EFF if the EFF eventually is going to become the leader of society. You don't lead by weights. You lead by action. You need to demonstrate to society that you can do it. Fighters, 20th of March, we are not fighting with anyone. We are not saying to anybody, you have wronged us. All we are asking for is for one man to step aside. It's for ESCOM to give us electricity. It's for the government to give us jobs. It can be correct that 60% of young people are unemployed and you call yourself an organization of the people and you do nothing about it. The streets are calling and we have never been scared of the streets. We are a protest movement. What we did in parliament, say I've got a personal relationship with Sir Ramaphosa. If I were to bump to to him now, I'm going to shake his hand, I'm going to take a picture with him, but it means nothing. I politically fundamentally disagree with him. 
and that should not be confused for personal attacks. This immaturity of South African politics that uh, if you, you, you know Cyril Ramaphosa, you can't disagree with him. Mbalula is my friend. I disagree with him fundamentally. I've got many friends in the ANC. I don't agree with them. And they know that when we start debating politics, we can't find each other. So we avoid talking politics. What is common between me and Balula? We support parents, both of us. So it's easy to talk about parents. But if I must choose between Balula and the EFF, I will choose the EFF any day. I will not choose it. So there is nothing personal against President Ramaphosa. Personally, he's a very good guy. What did the president do? He did nothing. That is exactly why he must go. For doing nothing. You can't be on top and do nothing. That is the most irresponsible act of a man. To be on top and do nothing. So, he promised us jobs. There are no jobs. In parliament there, when we were fighting, we're not fighting, we're not going to attack Ramaphosa. We'll never do that. We're not crazy people. Why? We sit with Ramaphosa. Yeah, I told them yesterday, the only place where the president does not have bodyguards is parliament. We sit with him there. With no bodyguards. You can go and check everywhere. When the president sits down, behind him there is a bodyguard, not in parliament. Well, that is a safe heaven. No one must get injured there for holding a different view. What happens? I go to the stage to protest. I'm holding a placard like this. They say I was a danger to the president. A danger is a person who you can't see the hands. That's why they always say hands up. My hands were up. <laughs> to show that I come in peace. Here is my placard. I'm not fighting. I get beaten for coming in peace. And then it gets celebrated in South Africa that he was a threat to the president. I was not a threat to the president. I don't fight my politics physically. It doesn't mean I'm a coward. If a need comes, I fight physically. I'm not scared. But I don't fight my politics physically. I was going to stand on the stage with a placard and allow Ramaphosa to speak. And I'll also be speaking through my placard, through silent protest through peaceful protest that is protected by the constitution of the Republic of South Africa. And you require nobody's permission to get into protest. So when we go to police station and say, tomorrow we'll be marching from 9 to uh, 12, it's not a permission we're seeking. We're giving them information so that they can organize alternative routes. They confuse that to be seeking a permission. There is a constitutional court decision that nobody requires a permission to protest. And we'll be doing so on the 20th of March. We don't need anyone's permission. All of you seated here, you should be identifying the road or which one are you going to occupy. You should be identifying which comp shopping complex are you going to occupy. Which city are you going to close? And start sending them letters now. Please be informed. On the 20th of March, there is no work. There is no school. Everything stops. No truck will be moving. If there are taxi associations like here in the Cap Metro, by now you should have had meetings with them on how you are going to complement and support one another because we are not fighting with the taxis and those ones of metro buses by now they should have been told that on the 20th there is no bus that moves 
South Africa must come to a standstill. We must challenge white monopoly capital and we must show them that we don't need a permission from the Rupert, from the Minel, from the Oppenheimers. We don't need a permission from the ANC and from Mbalula. Who says no? People must go to school and children must go to work. We are not going to any school. And there are no children who are going to any work here. So it is going to come to a standstill. And that's when the EFF is going to show the mass power. And the Western Cape cannot be a failure. You are not going to fail. And remember, we are not going to start at 8 o'clock in the morning. 12 o'clock start to, I mean, uh, the 20th starts at 12 midnight. The preparations must be made from 12 midnight. By the time the people wake up, everything is happening. They are able to take pictures and send to their bosses. So it's not going to happen today. Today is not happening. So fighters, the militancy and the protest movement character of the EFF, the fearless character of the EFF, the ground forces of the EFF, your determination to liberate the people of South Africa is going to be seen on the 20th of March when you bring South Africa to a standstill. Thank you very much. I'm a king, yes, I'm a king, what? Think. I'm a king,